This is quick study number three, building a five-part decision model. Again, we'll be following along with this document, which takes us through the specific steps. And you can use this as reference, or you can use that as your primary source, um, if you'd like as well. As we did last time, we'll start World Modeler by double-clicking on the desktop. And again, World Modeler will open up without any model loaded into it. But this time, instead of starting from scratch, we're going to open that QR1 file that we opened last time. So I'll open that off of my desktop. Now, if you don't have the QR1 file, I'd like to point you back to quick study number one, and that will teach you how to build it. When we open a model file, it doesn't open the diagram automatically. There's two ways of opening a model diagram. First of all, we need to expand the model diagram folder, which is over here in the model browser. To expand that folder to see all the diagrams in my model, I click on the small blue triangle on the left-hand side, and you can see we have one diagram in that folder, which is called Product Launch. Now I can open that by right-clicking on Product Launch and selecting Open. The other thing that I can do is just drag that Product Launch to the right-hand side, and it will open that diagram. You might remember this model diagram that we created before, where we have profit margin on the right-hand side, and then cost and revenue, which lead to profit margin. Now, what I said last time is cost and revenue aren't really great examples of levers. So the first thing we're going to do is change these to intermediates, and then we'll create some real levers. To do that, I double-clicked on the cost attribute, and that opens the attribute definition symbol properties dialog. At the bottom of this, there's a field called Decision Model Role, and you can see I can change each of the attributes types. I can change a lever to an outcome, an intermediate, an external, or an unspecified type of attribute. For our purposes, we're going to consider cost an intermediate, so I'm going to left-click on Intermediate, and then click the OK button. We'll do the same thing to Revenue. Again, I'll double-click on Revenue opening up the Attribute sim Definition Symbol Properties dialog, and then I'll click and select Intermediate. Now, Intermediates really aren't any different from Levers in terms of how they function in the model. Instead, we have some standard color coding that just helps us distinguish the two. So in order to make room for some new Levers, I'm going to drag these three attributes to the right-hand side of the diagram. I'll do that using my left mouse button by just clicking in the colored area of each of these and dragging them across. And now I'm going to create three levers that are a little bit more realistic. These represent our investment in various aspects of our business. So for instance, we might invest in advertising. We might choose to invest in customer service. And we might choose to invest in enhancing our product by adding new product features. Now these boxes will open up quite wide so that they're wide enough to accommodate all of the text. I usually like to shrink them up and allow the text to wrap just so I have a little more screen real estate to work with. You can see I'm also resizing the boxes by clicking and dragging on the blue resize handles. A new kind of attribute that we haven't seen yet is something called an external. As we talk about in many of our blogs and webinars, an external in decision modeling is something that we can change in our model, but it represents something that we don't have control over in the real world. So for instance, our competitor brand is not something we can control, but we can make an estimate of how much investment our competitor puts into promoting their brand and generally what happens is these external factors, which represent the scenario in which your decision is taking place, combine with your levers through calculations in the intermediates in order to produce your outcomes. So in this case, again, we can't control our competitor's choice of investment in its brand, but certainly the degree to which it invests in its brand is going to have a big impact on the degree to which our investment in advertising, customer service, and product features ultimately impacts our profit margin. Let's talk about these intermediates again. Cost and revenue are both very easy to, to represent and to measure. Most corporations have various spreadsheets that store both of these pieces of information. 
However, when we start decision modeling, we often rep recognize that there are intermediates, factors that are part of a decision, that are harder to measure. These are called intangibles. And so I'm going to create a new intermediate representing customer satisfaction. Now, customer satisfaction is not as likely to be found in a cell on a spreadsheet. However, it has a huge impact on our revenues because it'll drive how many customers we have and the price that they'll be willing to pay for our product. So an important principle of decision modeling is to make sure that you haven't ignored intangibles. It turns out in many cases that even though intangibles are more difficult to measure, they actually have a huge impact on your decision making and so are very important to represent during decision modeling. Now customer satisfaction, we're going to model here in, in this simplified model, we're going to say that it's going to have a pretty big impact on the number of customers. And this is typical that we'll have a mixture of tangible and intangible factors which are linked together in order to reach the full decision model. Now since cost and revenue are no longer levers, we need to dig into these to change the formulas that define cost and revenue to be something a little bit more realistic. We kind of put in fake formulas last time. So what I'll do is I'll double, -check, double click on cost and when I do that, you can see in the Attribute Definition Symbol Properties dialog that there's two formulas associated with cost. We're going to edit new formula one, which is the one that we changed last time. If you recall, we set the cost to be cost plus two, just so that I could illustrate how time-based simulation worked. And if you remember when we ran the simulator in the last model, every time the timer ticked, cost increased by two. We're going to do something more realistic now, and we're going to say for this model that cost is the sum of advertising, and so I'm typing advertising and hitting the tab key, plus customer service. Be careful that you choose customer service, not satisfaction, plus product features. And I'm using my arrow keys and my tab key to auto-complete these values. I'll also change the run context to all because we're not using this just as a, a way of illustrating the timer. Now I'll say OK to change that formula and we'll say OK again. I'm also going to change the revenue formula. Now again, these formulas aren't fully realistic illustrations of a full decision model and so um, you're going to see something that, that is just approximate for now. So I'm going to change, I'm going to add a new formula to revenue. And I'm going to change it to number of customers times 20. So basically I'm assuming that my uh, revenues, my, my price of my product is 20, and I multiply that by the number of customers within a particular time period in order to determine my total revenue. Now in a real decision model, obviously this 20 would be a lever, it would be a price that we're setting. But in the simple model, we'll just hard code it. Oh, I didn't set a run context. This is something I forget all of the time. <laughs> so usually your run context is going to be all. And I'll say OK, and then we'll say OK again. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the number of customers will initialize to 5. And to do that, I'll add a formula. We'll say init for the run context, which means that's what it gets set to as we start our modeling. And then I'll just do the number five and say OK. And say OK again. I'm going to add a few dependency lines here. I am going to connect advertising, customer service, and product features to cost. And since those lines overlap, I'm going to do a bit of rearranging to make this a little bit neater. And as, you, as we talked about, the customer satisfaction is going to determine our number of customers. And the number of customers is also going to determine the revenue. Now I'll remind you again, these arrows don't really matter very much. Uh, they're just decorative so that we can sort of see the data flow in this model, um, in the 2D model, as well as in the 3D side. 
but uh, generally speaking you might not want to have all of the arrows shown just because things can get pretty cluttered. So again the real functionality comes from the way that we've defined those expressions, those formulas uh, for each of these attributes. So that's a five-part decision model. We have levers, externals, intermediates, and profit margins, as well as the dependencies that connect them. So we won't go much further into this model, but let's take a look at the 3D view of this as well. And what you can see now is we have all of those parts of the decision model shown in the 3D view. Now in the current version of World Modeler, we've chosen to make invisible those attributes that haven't been initialized. And that's a pretty good way to see that we need to do a little more work within the model itself. If you recall, we didn't set a formula for customer satisfaction, and that's why it's invisible. And we didn't set a formula or an initialization for competitor brand. So let's just fix that really quickly. I'll click back using my inset view to the 2D view. Double click on competitor brand. Actually, let's do something different. I'm going to cancel out of that. I'm going to take this formula and I'm going to show you a, a new way we can create a formula. Instead of clicking on this, I'm going to hold down my left mouse button and drag it. And when I do that, I can have the formula appear on the window, as you'll see in a moment. Maybe we'll initialize our competitor brand to 10. And we'll say that's an init value. And now I'll say OK. And you can see that that formula appears right here on the 2D window. Now your formulas don't have to appear on the 2D window. This is purely a convenience if you'd like to do it that way. And so it's, it's possible to delete them from the 2D window, but if they're still within the model browser, those formulas will still exist. So you don't need to worry that they won't execute. This is just another way of displaying formulas on the screen. So I'll exit out of my previous 3D diagram, open up my add window again, and now we can see that competitor brand is shown here in the 3D diagram. And really what we have is just the beginnings of an interactive decision model. You can see as I make various investments, they increase my cost, and that my competitor brand is not wired up yet, but it has a value that can change. Ultimately, we will uh, be setting all of the values within this model and creating a full simulation that shows how different choices around these various levers can ultimately impact our profit margins. Finally, let's save this model so that we can use it in later quick studies. I'll say File, Save As, and I'm going to call this one QS2.WorldModel.